All right. Well, I'm going to kick this off. A um, couple housekeeping things. Uh, if you when when you ask your questions, please put them in the Q and A as opposed to the chat. You can be anonymous in the Q and A if you want. There's a little box you can check. Um, and I might ask a couple questions and tell you to put them in the chat, then put it in the chat. But otherwise, just keep your questions in the Q and A. Um, it gets captured, and it's just it just works better. Um, and again, welcome to Office Hours. This is College Aid Pro. I'm Peg Keo, so um, my regulars know me. You guys see me almost every week here, but um, I'm the Director of Education, work with parents, work on the side with the advisors, so I'm kind of all over the place. Um, but really what gets us out of bed at College Aid Pro is helping you guys navigate this process. And I this will segue right into me introing our guest, Shelly Howard, and she is the CEO of College Ready, and and I want to get your it all correct, and CR Tutoring and Test Strategies. I just always say College Ready. So we're super excited to have her, and Shelly, she works on the financial side, but she's also an expert that we are not at College Aid Pro on the admission side. You know, as people have heard me say, there's academic, personal, and financial fit. So we focus on the financial fit at College Aid Pro, but Shelly also um, works with kids and students on the academic and personal fit. So why don't you just take a couple minutes, just tell everybody a little bit about you. And then Shelly's gonna share a few bits of information that, that we feel will be relevant to you guys. And then we're going to open it up to questions. So now you'll be able to ask admission questions, which usually we don't do. So super, super fun this week. Well, thank you so much for having me. And anything goes. A little bit of background. Um, as uh, Peg mentioned, I am an independent college consultant. That is one of my many certifications that I now hold. Um, I bring that up because it all actually started with my own child. And so I always like parents to know why did College Ready get started? Because I was a parent trying to figure out how to navigate all of this back in 2008. So this is my 15th application season. <laughs> you guys are like, whoa. Um, I have completed the FAFSA nine times on my own. And I will tell you, it is not as scary as one might think. I do focus on the academic fit, the social fit, the athletic fit, and the financial fit, but I am not a certified planner and I don't sell a financial product. Mine is strictly get your financial house in order, parents, students, do everything you can to get the big scholarships. And ultimately, my mission is to help a million families get into the best fit college and graduate debt free. A little bit about uh, my accolades. Uh, my oldest graduated from Harvard. Uh, he graduated debt free, headed off to UC San Diego Medical School, and now he's an orthopedic surgeon at UCLA. My second is a registered nurse. She went through the University of Alabama, full ride. My third is my stepson. He's at San Francisco State in broadcasting. And the baby is leaving for Prague. She's going to study international business in the Czech Republic. So I have a pretty diverse personal story that if you have any questions, I tell that story not as a proud mom, but really as target practice. If you guys have questions, I know this last child she didn't want to do what her siblings did so she's going international and that was like a whole new world so i can really speak to the ivies to the public to the private um college ready has students inside the us and out of the us we are a true global consulting firm and so we would love to answer any questions you have about anything as a applies to college admissions. Awesome. Awesome. Well, the, the questions are already flowing in here. Is there anything you want to share on the admission side that's timely, you know, with the group before we jump into the questions? 
Yeah, there's some hot things going on right now. And so I think it'd probably be important to talk about them. Uh, for the students who um, really leaned into test optional, uh, we are seeing some backlash right now from schools that did pivot and make it test needed to apply. So just be mindful if your student is a really good test taker, have them take the test and keep their options open. We tried to warn students last year that this was a possibility and now it's not a ton, but it is really hard to tell the student, I'm sorry, they won't, they won't accept you because you're not submitting a test score. So I think that's top of mind. The other thing that's top of mind right now is um, finding the best college fit. Everybody I'm talking to, I'm getting high school seniors who are calling me right now um, asking, you know, how do I pick the best fit school? How do I know where to start? And really, it's getting very clear about what that student wants. It's not just fitting a student into a brand name. College is the stepping stone to their future. What do they want to do after college should play a pretty big piece into the colleges that you pick. Those are the things that are very top of mind right now. Okay. All right. I'm learning, which is awesome because I don't, I'm not a specialist on that side. So more and more, some schools are actually going back to the old format. So as always, you got to be on top of all that stuff or be working with somebody who's on top of it because just the way it goes in this space. So, all right, we're getting a lot of questions. Yes, we are not going to be focusing all on academics. You can shoot any questions to Shelly and I, um, someone said, will I be able to ask any UTMA questions? Yes, I will answer what I think your UTMA question is. If you have an UTMA, and if that's not ringing a bell, don't worry, that just means you don't have it. It's a certain kind of custodial account that is an asset of your, your whoever is, is it was gifted to. So if it's your child's UTMA, which is usually the case, it's it's going to be an asset of your child. There are strategies to move that into being an asset of the parents, one of them being to move it into what's called a custodial 529. I'm not recommending you do that. I need, I would need to know a lot more about your situation. One, is it even going to help you be eligible for need-based aid? So you've got to know what your EFC estimates are and then do a little planning and see if you make that change. And you could have capital gains when you liquidate the account. So it's not as straightforward as that, but I'm thinking that that was your question. So if it's not, um, definitely write in again, but I think I, I think I got that one. So let me can go I, up here. Can I add on to that? Sure, sure. Um, the thing that I recommend is there's a lot of really great advice and Pegs was straight on the money when she said, it has to be right for you. And so I like parents to understand because the decisions that you make financially affect your student academically as well as financially. And so I love the fact most people, you know, take something and like, that's it. I'm going to go close it down. And I'm like, whoa, cool your jets. It may not be beneficial like Peg suggested. And so having the knowledge is one thing, but looking at the overall strategy is very important. Yep, yep, very good point. Um, okay, here's one. My son is a senior, 2023. He is taking a class at the community college. Do you recommend tapping 529s to pay for that? He is able to go on a choir trip. Does that qualify? Can I pay for IP? AP test with 529. So with 529 funds per the IRS, it needs to be spent distributions in order to be um, the gains to not be taxable and no penalty that has to be spent on qualified higher education expenses. And that definition is tuition and fees, room and board, books, um, it, computer now is on there, anything that the college requires, a choir trip, that that isn't part of it. So that would be a no. Like you can pull it, but you're going to have to pay tax on the earnings and a 10% penalty. The AP test fees, no. So it has to be tuition and fees. Now, community college tuition, yes, because that's tuition. So that's that's totally fine. And keep a paper trail. 
because if you get audited, you just want to be able to show, hey, here's my proof that I actually spent this on qualified education expenses. Do we recommend you tapping your 529? That's a question we'd have to sit down with you and look at your overall plan. And, and you know, Shelly and I will probably say that a bunch tonight. We're not trying to dodge questions, but really the best answer that you can give in this space, if I was going to just record something and never show up would be, it depends because it literally <laughs> does. Like I have twins and, and the answer could be different for my son, Brennan versus my daughter, Shannon, because they were different students, right? It isn't, there's just, that's why we exist, Shelly and I and Cap, because it's a pretty complicated, nuanced deal. So we can't, I can't really tell you if you should, um, but you definitely can. Tuition for, for community college is, is a qualified education expense. The only thing that I would add to that is dual enrollment. Sometimes that gets a little iffy if your student is taking it at the high school, but yet you're getting college credit. So ask and make sure before you just do. I agree. Yeah. Like in the state of Washington, we have something called running start. You just want to have your ducks in a row and talk to, um, you could even call the 529 because the 529s too are by state. And so you also should check with 529s because sometimes the federal government will say, hey, you can do this, but the state doesn't follow it. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, okay, I'm self-employed on the CSS. It isn't necessary to answer that, but it also says not to include the additional taxes we pay. Oh, this I think this question came in on our support line. We pay due to my self-employment income. How will they know I'm self-employed if I don't answer? Also, I'm a freelance designer with my business registered as sole proprietor. Would I list my business as worth zero? Your business value is basically if you were going to sell your business. So a lot of people that are consultants or it's them that people are buying, if you go to sell, you know, you're retiring, unless you have a book that you're going to sell that somebody would pay for your book of clients, um, a lot of people have zero as their business value. If you have office space, if you have inventory, if you have equipment, if you have business accounts that have 200 grand sitting in them in the business, those are all things that would be part of the value of your business. Um, I know this question is about the CSS. Remember on the FAFSA, at least for this coming year, it's going to change the next year. If you, you said you're sole proprietor. So if you have less than a hundred full-time employees, you don't, don't put the value of your business on the FAFSA, but you will have to explain it on the CSS. And I think this person is referencing, we always say, don't answer optional questions on the CSS. They will know you're self-employed because after you submit the form, they're going to ask for all of your tax returns and your W-2s. So they will be doing a deep dive into your finances and, and they will see if you're a sole prop, they're going to see your schedule C. So they will absolutely know you're self-employed. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it from that, that standpoint. Um, how far back in bank statements did the CSS colleges ask for? So basically assets are assessed, the value of your non-retirement assets, not your retirement accounts, the day you hit submit, literally. So it's very, very current. So if you have a checking account, most people honestly look at their statements from the end of the month before. I don't think they log on and actually look, but technically you could. So if the market, I haven't looked at the market today and what it did, but it's tumbling, you might want to look before you submit because you might have lost some value from the end of last month. But um, they don't look back. They, it's the current value. But remember, 401ks, 403bs, Roth IRAs. I always get that question because I think people don't realize that's a retirement account, individual IRAs. Those are all retirement accounts. So the ba those balances should not be included. That's a very common mistake um, because it gets kind of confusing. All right, Shelly, I'm throwing the next one at you and you can kick it back to me if you want. Um, how should I report home value if I have a HELOC? So HELOC's home equity line of credit for people based on full line or available amount. Is that something you deal with, Shelly? Okay. I don't deal with that. I will take it. 
I say you put your full line, subtract your full line, because that's what you can take, right? That's what I would say. Now, the college might interpret that differently, but that's how I would handle that. If you have a $200,000 line, pull it off. Um, okay, here you go. Here's one for you, Shelly. Is it best to apply for early admissions for college scholarships? Early admissions, like early decision or? Maybe, maybe hit early decision and early action and we can kind of compare. Okay, okay. Um, so scholarships, the first thing the student has to do is get in. <laughs> so that's the first thing I have families really consider unless finances are the most important part of your process, right? Because there's the academic the social fit and the financial fit. If you can't go to a school without full scholarships, that's a very different strategy than somebody who can go, but would like some money back, please. So you have to get really clear on what is the most important thing to you. If you go early decision, it is very binding and it's very expensive. So if you are one of those people who don't feel that you can't afford it without significant contribution from the university, it is a very terrifying thing to do. On the other hand, if you go early acceptance, you need to know the rules because at some, in some areas, you can only apply to one early accept. In, in other schools, you can, private versus public, you can actually work, do a workaround. So it's not as simple as what is the best. I will tell you that it is better to have a really good application and essay and get it in midway versus turning in a somewhat well done essay and application just to get it in early. So really the number one thing I would share is in a perfect world, if your student can get the application and essay polished and ready to go and can submit on opening day, absolutely that, that gives the student great advantage. It shows the university, you know, they're important. So it's not as simple as, and, and it depends on the university. Like there's some universities who only open on a certain day and close on a certain day, and they don't look at your application until all applications have come in. So it's really a school by school, college by college, not across the board, but the big money comes from the universities themselves. Yep, the endowments. I, I'm a personal lover of early action for your application if the school has it, just because it's not binding like Shelly was describing and your, your child will get the decision sooner and every kid I've ever known is just so happy when they get into their first college, even if it's not their first choice, because they're like, oh, yay, I'm going to college. Um, you get your financial aid award letter earlier. You have more time to, to look at the finances. To me, there's just no downside of, of doing it that way. So, okay. Do you have to report a 529 account on the FAFSA if it is set up for a younger sibling? So that's a great question. The answer is yes. So if you have two kids and you're the owner of two different 529s as a parent and you have each one of your kids as a beneficiary, yes, that's considered your asset, not your child. So you own it and 529, different than the UTMA that I was talking about earlier. So you own it. So both of those accounts should go in there. You can appeal on that though. Like if you have a, you know, I've worked with a few families where they'll have over a hundred thousand for each child. Well, I tell them, hey, reach out and show documentation that, you know, the second one, the beneficiary is for your younger child. Sometimes they take it into account, sometimes they don't. But yes, you should be including both of those values, or if you have three kids, all three in the answer. Um, does the CSS profile require documentation beyond our 2021 tax return? Do they need bank statements? So after you submit it, they will reach out and either you'll be sending it directly to them some way securely, or there's a third party called IDOC. So if you get something from IDOC, it's not phishing, it's, it's legit. They, as you're saying, for a class of 2023, all the questions are going to be about 2021 tax year. 
So that's everything you're going to be sending. It'll be W-2s, tax returns. I have not seen a school ask for bank statements. They don't routinely ask for proof of assets. When they get your tax returns, if you're saying that you don't have, you know, if you're saying, oh, we have $5,000 in our savings account, but they look on your tax return and you have $20,000 of dividends, they're going to they're gonna reach back out and say, hey, did you ever get an account? Where are these dividends coming from? And then they might get into it, but they don't, they don't ask right off the top, please send all of your bank statements. One thing on that, Peg, I had a personal experience when I was applying to Harvard. Um, when we got to the CSS, um, both parents were self-employed and they asked for bank statements. Oh, interesting. Okay. And that, see, and that's specifically Harvard because when you get into the CSS, you're going to notice too that at the end, there's a bank of supplemental questions. And so Harvard and Cornell and Occidental can say, hey, I want to ask question one, nine and 50. And so you'll see, you'll think you're done, but then you're actually, not. there's a little bit more to do. So the schools can all ask for whatever they want, right? So you, you kind of, this is a bit of an organizational thing. If you have a bunch of CSS schools to kind of help your student and make sure you get get the school everything that they're asking for. Um, here's another Utma question. And then I've got one that's right up your alley, Shelly. Um, I'll, I'll read it to you in a sec. We have set up Utmas for our two children, senior and freshman in high school. At the time we set them up, we were not US citizens and we're concerned with the continuity of any other plans. Now we are US citizens. We wanna know if there are any strategies to reduce the impacts. The main strategy, and again, I'm not recommending it without knowing more about your situation, but I'm saying it is a strategy, is those can be transferred into what's called a custodial 529. So they are now in a 529 account, but it's called custodial, not just regular 529. And that tells anybody who knows, hey, that came from a custodial account, but it is then considered an asset of the parents which is better. It's uh, assessed up to 5.64% instead of 20 or 25% for the student. You need to do a little homework to see if you need to do that strategy. And also for your senior, you can't move what you can't move assets in kind. And in kind means you can't move a mutual fund or a stock over to a 529. You have to liquidate that UTMA and then move cash. And when you liquidate that, that could create capital gains. You have to look and see which is going to go on your child's tax return, which could shoot, which will increase an EFC for that tax year. So you don't want to make this decision, you know, in a bubble, right? You got to look at all the ramifications of it before you do it. And the main one is knowing is that is this going to really help us? The other thing is once it in a it's in a 529, as I said earlier got to be spent on qualified education expenses, whereas in UTMA, you could go buy sneakers for your child. All it has to be spent on is for the benefit of your child. Much more open definition earlier, somebody asked about choir. You could take a money, at, money out of an UTMA for all of those things, but you can't for if in a 529. So it's, it's more restrictive. So you just want to keep that in mind as well. Okay. All right. Here we go, Shelly. So RE admissions, when the high school counselor says to have two to three each of solid choices, reach, high reach, et cetera. Wow, I never heard of reach and high reach. I haven't either. What, <laughs> what numbers am I supposed to be looking at to understand what's a realistic and what's a reach school? So that's a great question. And it's very challenging to find on the internet. I'm just going to so, say so. If you're frustrated, you have every right to be. Um, we actually get our data directly from the colleges from the year prior. And so that's the information we use. We look at your GPA, your test scores, your community service hours, your extracurriculars, your leadership. And so there's many factors to deciding. It's not just one. So what it comes down to is, does your GPA fall into 
average or better than average, right? If it is way below average, that is a, what did she call it? A high reach. (laughs) (laughs) So if you're like, woo, yeah, I'm not quite, but you know what? I encourage students to dream. Don't let go of the dream. They may need to balance their class with an East coast or a West coast. So, you know, I, I just believe that students, you don't know what's going to happen. We do it a little bit different. We believe that everything has a reason. Your reach schools are going to be your dream schools. You're not quite qualified, but there's a shot you could get in with a brilliant essay or some standout internship or research project. Um, But typically there's no money, merit money involved with that because you want to think of this like a business, right? If you're an employer and somebody brings you a a very large, deep resume, you're going to pay them a lot. If somebody brings you no experience, you're going to pay them minimum wage. That's kind of like a reach school. And then there's the comfort school. That's where you are considered right in the middle of it. And that is a nice place to be because there's money a lot of times tapped into that. And there's some really great schools in that. The safety schools we have on the list for a couple of reasons. One, if you pick the most generous safety schools, there's a lot of money to be made. If they want you, they will pay for it. The second piece is um, you want to have at least one school in your home state. With COVID, the kids who didn't do it that way were scrambling at the last minute. Our students who did have a plan C, we didn't know it was a COVID C, but our plan C, that was safety. Or if a parent gets sick or a grandparent gets ill, it's really, really wise to have a safe school nearby just in case. So strategically, each one of them are important. The other thing is, do you want to just get into the school and you don't care about the major or anything else? then you will apply with a major that's not as compacted or there's totally different strategies to do that. So if you're, it it really comes down to your intention. Are you looking for the best academic fit, the best social fit or the best financial fit? And then you build your college list to have those opportunities. So long-winded answer, but it's, again, it's just not one size fits all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's usually the case with most, most of this stuff in this space. Um, Okay. What is the financial threshold for loans? I have a simple savings account for my child of 20 K along with a five, two, nine, 30 K. We have issues receiving loans. Well, first of all, if you submit the FAFSA, your child is automatically eligible for what are called federal direct student loans. There's two different kinds. There's subsidized and unsubsidized. But if your child submits the FAFSA, you do it with them 27,000 over four years. There's no other application. It's your child's debt only in their name, only under their social security number. So there is no threshold for those loans. Loans after that, there's parent loans that are based on one parent applying and the credit comes in there. It's not as strict as outside loans, um, but there is no income threshold to get the federal direct student loans and the parent plus loan. Unfortunately, in my opinion, is pretty easy to get. And that's where a lot of people get into hot water. And then private loans, you know, it's, it, you're going to be applying for a loan. It's based on your credit score, your income and all that sort of stuff. Um, I wouldn't worry too much unless you have a child just starting now. Um, you, I, I wouldn't worry too much about loans right now. Um, I am divorced and my son is with me 66% of the time. Do I need to include my ex-husband income and assets? No. The way it works on the FAFSA is only one parent, if you're divorced or separated, is submitting with the child. And it's the custodial parent. And the definition for this coming FAFSA, the one that goes live on October 1st, is the parent where the child spent the most time. And in your question, you share 66% of the time your son's with you. So you are submitting it, your income, your assets. If you're remarried, that needs to be included, but your ex-husband's, none of his information will be on the FAFSA. So it's really cut and dry. The definition of who submits 
for the 24-25 school year is going to change. It's not about where the child spent the most time. It's about who provides more financial support to the child. But tune in. We will do webinars on this. We talk about it all the time in our webinars now. So definitely uh, pay attention to your email because we're offering educational support, this being one place, but also through our webinars. Can I, can I piggyback on that? Sure. I was in I was in that situation and nobody nobody told me prior to it, the experience the CSS profile will make the biological father part of the story or at least they did for us. <laughs> and so if that is a problem um you'll want to be strategic on what schools have the CSS profile. And if it's a problem to get the biological parent to participate, you might not want to apply to CSS schools. I wish somebody would have told me because it's not always as easy as just asking for help. Yeah, that's a biggie. Like if you can put in for a waiver, um, but they're and each school decides if they're going to waive the non-custodial parent. But typically, well, always if it's just the parent doesn't want to that's not going to work. Like if they're incarcerated or they've been off the grid and nobody knows where they are, some of those situations you can get a waiver. But yeah, that's there are some schools that don't look at the non-custodial parent, but the lion's share of them do in some capacity. And just this question that's in here, kind of in the same line of how the CSS works, they look at your primary home equity. So the home you live in. So the value minus your mortgages if you have a HELOC, like somebody asked about, if you in your regular, your primary mortgage, but there are some schools that don't look at it. And one of the questions was, are there schools besides Hamilton? And yes, there are. Stanford, I'm looking at my cheat sheet over here, Whitman, UVA, Bucknell. We actually have that built into MyCap. So if you set up your free MyCap account or you're in the upgraded version in our scholar level, you will notice if you compare Stanford and Northwestern, you're going to see different outputs, even though they both require the CSS, because Stanford doesn't look at home equity at all. And that can be a great planning opportunity for especially our housing market in this country has gone crazy. So a lot of people are sitting on some sizable equity, and that could really move the needle on an EFC, because some of these schools will actually look at almost all of it, which is crazy because no bank will let you access it. Um, and that's an appeal item too. Like, what? how are you valuing my home? And, and what are you expecting me to spend? You know, that's a very justifiable reach out to a college once you get in. Um, let's see here. Um, all right. If my child gets local scholarships, do the colleges deduct that amount from my need-based scholarship? Would you like to handle that one, Shelly, or you want me I'm to- I'm gonna let you handle that one. Okay, so this one, it depends. That's um, what I was gonna say. <laughs> if, yeah, and I've had this, this happen. I had a child who got a, a Girl Scout scholarship, right, for 15,000 bucks. She got into Stanford. Stanford happens to meet 100% in need. So they met 100% in need. So when she got that scholarship, then they are going to start deducting because they meet, met 100% in need. So I got the Girl Scouts to at least split it between two years. And then Stanford took the loans away and the work study, but the student did lose a little bit of a Stanford grant. So it saved Stanford a little money, but not all colleges meet 100% of need. So if you get a scholarship like that, and they've what's called gapped you, meaning they meet 75% of need. So your EFC is 20,000. They gave a merit scholarship or some need-based aid, but there's still another 15,000 and your child gets a local scholarship for 2,000. They should not go and take, well, merit aid, I've never seen them take away. Um, but need-based aid, they should not do that. And if you see them do that, I would have a really very assertive conversation <laughs> with that college for sure. I, I I wish they did not. I think that's wrong. I feel like that should that should be pulled away from the EFC, but that's not how most states do it. Some states will not reduce, but a lot of them still do. That's why I tell people outside scholarships are great, but as Shelly said earlier, grab as much endowment money as you can 
and then fill the gap with private scholarships because you could end up doing a lot of work for private scholarships and then lose some of the endowment money depending on um, your, your family situation. Um, if our former homestead is currently rented while we're overseas expats, does FAFSA need to look at our equity in it? So any, any real estate you have outside of your primary home that you live in, you're gonna need to disclose. If you're renting it and it's in a business and it's a family owned business with less than hundred full-time employees then you don't have to disclose that for the upcoming FAFSA because that exclusion, the business exclusion is still available. That's gonna change in the, in the October, 2023 FAFSA, but yes, you would have to disclose that because that's part of your real estate. Okay, I'm trying to look and see if I can find one that's specific. Hello, curious if both parents need to apply for FAFSA if divorce. So we talked about that. No, I already went through that one. So we're good there. Um, I'm looking for some admissions ones. We'll, we'll hit all these, but. Um, I might I might be able to share while you're checking, Peg. Um, parents, uh, if you're thinking about the strategy, that's what I'm really big on. Um, the, the sooner you start to plan and get your financial house in order, the better opportunity your student will have because you'll know what's coming. I was a parent who did, a, I started the 529 the minute my children were born because that is all that was offered to me. I had no idea what was on the FAFSA and what wasn't. I, you are so lucky to have Peg and her team, let me tell you, because when I was going through this, I actually read the FAFSA form. Talk about dry read, like put yourself to sleep. It's painful, parents. But when this amount of money is at risk, I believe in return on investments. College can be a great return on investment if done properly. But the sooner you start to understand the FAFSA is not just looking at your gross or your net. There's a lot of other pieces to that puzzle. And so these questions are fantastic. I'm just so impressed. I would encourage you to really start, you know, if you have younger kids, look at how it will impact you because the way the FAFSA is changing, as Peg alluded to, they're gonna look at the number of students in college differently in the new form. So the more you know, it's kind of like you could do your own taxes or you hire a CPA kind of thing. It's very similar to what Peg and her team are doing. And I love this. It makes me so happy that you all are here asking these questions. So I just wanted to say thank you, parents, for doing your due diligence and really, you know, putting yourself in the right place. Yeah, pat yourself on the back for sure. All right. We got 529 question. I got that one done. Okay. Here's one that um I've seen twice and then I'll have admission one for you, Shelly. So if a parent works at a university that gives as a perk money toward um, child toward any university tuition up to 50%, which is awesome, I've seen that. How does that get figured into the FAFSA for the first year of college and beyond? Is it considered income or asset for a student or not counted until second year? So that's considered, that's like a scholarship kind of. It's an outside resource, right? So that's going to come into the equation that whatever I, I've had kids in the past where the mom worked at Stanford and Stanford had that. I think Davidson might have that. You know, different schools have that. That's an amazing perk. So they, I'm sure they, they say, where's your child going to school? And they send it right there. So if you're getting need-based aid and all of a sudden this big resource comes in, that could affect it. But you're, it, you, the endowment's paying it or the other university's paying it. It's all good. It's a great, um, it's an awesome, awesome perk to have. And you should be, you know, planning for that in your four-year cash flow. And I would just include it like as an outside scholarship, whatever, whatever that value is. So that's how it works. It's, it's not something you're going to put as a line as your asset or 
income or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about that piece. So I did see, okay, here's a couple for you. So can you comment on the benefits or potential drawbacks of honors programs? Do you know if they are viewed favorably by employers? Honors programs, I'm guessing in high school? I'm thinking he might mean or in, um, college. in college being in an honors program because employers, that makes me think that he's talking about in yeah. college. Yeah, I can touch on both of them. It's okay. Um, so obviously when you're applying to college, the, they ask for honors activities and awards, very simply stated on the application. And it's always beneficial to have the highest honor possible. So an international, then a national, then a regional, then a local, then a school. The same type of thing for, it depends on what you wanna do for your career. But for an example, if you were honored and your research paper was published in college, oh yes, that is going to be beneficial if you're applying for a job that that makes a difference. If the honor is in something that the, the employer can use, it's going to be hugely beneficial. If it's an honor in something that's not going to be useful to the company, it's really at the company's discretion. Okay. All right, great. I was just typing an answer while you were chatting to another question. I'll just give my little parent answer to that too. Like my son went to IU and was in the business school, Indiana University, go Hoosiers. And um, and he was like, mom, I want to get into the honors college. And he just missed it. It was like a 375 and he never had that as a GPA. And I was actually happy to be honest because he, and he even said later, a lot of his frat buddies that were in the honors college, they had to spend that much more time on academics. Mm -hmm. And he ended up doing other things and being in microfinance and traveling. So it afforded him more time to do things outside of the classroom that built his resume. This is just me, my parent view on it. I thought that was actually a good thing, but I know some of the, the consulting firms that came to, um, to interview at Kelly, the school of business, they were all about what's your GPA. And so kind of depends, right? It, it, it depends, but I, I was happy that he, you know, worked hard academically, but then he also got to do other stuff to kind of see what he wanted to do. So, um, this is a good question and I'm just going to answer it live. I was typing it, but I'm not done. When is the FAFSA due? It depends. Like all the colleges have what's called priority financial aid deadlines for the forms. So what I recommend you do is Google. It's, it's, it's easy to just Google it. And then you'll probably, the top link will take you right to what you want. If your child's applying to seven schools, just Google all of them, see what the deadline is. And just, I always tell people shoot to get it in a few days before because say your internet goes out and we have windstorms out here in Seattle and then all the power's out, then you're going to miss a deadline. Because if you miss deadlines, then you're giving them an opportunity to say, sorry, family, we're not going to give you what, what you should get because you missed the deadline. So shoot to get it in. There are some schools, but not most, that are first come, first serve, right? So if that's the case, you want to get it in early. And if you could be eligible for state aid in your state, most states you want to get in that queue. I will tell you the FAFSA is usually a train wreck the first week. It crashes a lot. So I usually tell people don't add that stress to your plate. If the if your deadline is November 1 or November 15th, your first deadline, don't don't worry about getting in there the first week. So um Can I add a little something to that, Peg? Sure. sure. So absolutely the the sooner you can be ready to to submit. And, and do quality is amazing. But when we do financial negotiations on the flip side, so say you, you know, didn't get it all done in time, um, but you submitted it and you made the deadline, um, you can always uh, ask for a reconsideration if your finances have changed. A lot of people are worried when I talk to my clients, they don't want to submit too soon because somebody might lose a job or, you know, th those kind of like life happening kind of thing. It's not the party's over if you 
you know, once you submit it, you can always ask for a reconsideration. And most colleges are really good about honoring it if you have something legit to explain why. So I just wanted to add that to take the fear away, maybe from doing it sooner than later. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with sooner. I just hate to have people in there on October one and wanting yeah. to pull their hair out because for sure it's crashing and it doesn't work, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people just like, I want to get it off my plate. That's never going to hurt you to get it in early. Um, that's for sure. Um, Okay. Wow. There's a lot of 529 UTMA. Yeah. A 529 is a different kind of account from an UTMA. An UTMA is a custodial account. So it's the asset of the, the child, right? Because it's been, it's actually been gifted to that person and you can't take it back. A 529, if it's, if the parent is the owner, that's a parent asset and the parent will pay um, tax on the earnings and a penalty, but they could say, you know what? Our child's misbehaving. We're not paying for college anymore. And they could go to Europe with that money. The UTMA, you can't do that. Once it's gifted to that recipient, it's their money. And the UTMA, as I said earlier, is an asset of the student, which stings more in the calculation for the EFC, assessed at a higher rate, might not matter for your family. You got to you got to look at that. Um, somebody put in the same question twice. I'm going to do this one because I think she was the first question. She thought I might not have seen it. Okay. Uh, we got separated in July, 2020. Our separation is not legal yet. If you're living in a separate place for six months in the financial aid world, that's all that matters. It doesn't have to be finalized. Not sure it will be by the end of December. I'm aware only custodial parents enter income, but our tax returns for 2021, 22 will be married filing jointly, can't file separately. Yep, yep. Will that be a problem on the FAFSA? Um, no, and this is, I don't know if we want to get in the weeds on this. I counsel people to fill out their FAFSA and CSS a little bit differently when you've got, uh, when you are divorced and the tax return that they're asking about is married filing jointly. I counsel people to separate um, their, their assets and separate out the income. Um, it's not the right way to do it. It's the way that I tell people to do it. Um, and then you follow up with the school. It's not wrong, but it's Peg's way, right? <laughs> then you follow up with the school with tax returns. You're gonna have to have a conversation in that situation with all the schools anyways. So that's how I counsel people to do it. You might have somebody else who says, just submit it, married, filing jointly, and then have the conversation. But to me, it's not right, right? Because that's not your reality anymore. So that might be something, the person that submitted that question, that you might want to book an hour with an expert and get in the weeds and have somebody look over what you submit, because we do that. If you're, you can set up a free account in the software, and then at any time, if you need an hour with one of our experts, you can book it right through the software. It's two ninety nine for the hour. Um, just a little, uh, just a little bit of info. When you jump on our webinars, we will offer discounts sometimes, so it's worth your while. You'll learn a lot. Um, and if there might be a discount, you can grab that code and and not pay two ninety nine too. But that would be a good situation just for your peace of mind to to run it by one of our experts. Make sure you got it in there right because it gets a little, you know. It's, it's a little sticky in that situation. Um, my daughter is not sure what she wants to study, although she has at least some interest in business. Would you recommend her apply to business colleges when making her application? So this is definitely a Shelly question. <laughs> I get the chills with this one. I, I really, you know, these kids are 15, 16, and 17. And as a mom of five, I, I've watched each child go through this very differently. So first, my heart goes out to you and to your student. The best thing you can do for that student is to help them figure out who they are and why it matters. Help them to get very um, in tune with their core values, their passions, their advocacy before you make that kind of investment. And then... For a student who's not at least 75, 85% sure, I recommend that their top three majors be at every college they apply to. The chances of a student switching majors is one in three. So we have 100% success because we do it early on 
our, our students have their top three majors, their top three colleges, and they know how much money they'll make in the trajectory for them when they get out of college. Will that job be done by a robot or will that job be growing strong? The sooner you can help your student figure that out, well, one, it will just feel nice for them because they probably are tired of guessing or, or telling people they don't know, but it's really risky to pick a school if the student is not really, really um, aware of what that looks like. A business school may not be a good fit for a student who decides they want to go into engineering or law. So um, it, a lot of times they get to college and they have a professor that just inspires them. And all of a sudden they're heading down this other path and then everything can get totally derailed. The sooner you can help that student, we have a program called See Our Future Now. And I guide the student one by one to figure out all of this, not by just some test fill in the bubble, but by having conversations to help that student get really clear about what it is they want for their future. So it will make a difference. And ultimately, every time a student transfers it is a huge expense to the family. It is not a cheap way of getting through this process. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you communicate on the CSS that my dependents, and I mean, I'm assuming you mean your child's, that the, you're talking about that's gonna go to college, current social security benefits will expire in her senior year of high school. If the child is receiving benefits, the student that is not included on the FAFSA or the CSS profile, okay? Um, if parents are getting them, that's completely different, but you don't have to worry about that. That's that is not taxable and is the, those benefits are not included on the financial aid forms. So don't worry about that. Um, let's see what else we have here. If a non-custodial parent who isn't filling out the FAFSA be contributing 50% of college costs and wants access to their own Parent PLUS loan, can they fill out their own FAFSA? They don't need to fill out a FAFSA. Either parent can apply for a Parent PLUS loan. Even if you're married, one parent applies. Um, and it's very, it's usually the answer is very quick. So you don't have to submit a FAFSA. The FAFSA you're submitting is your child's FAFSA. Parents aren't submitting a FAFSA. It's the student's FAFSA under their FSA ID and password and their social security and their date of birth. Remember, they're the student. If you put in the FAFSA, and I've had parents do this, then I tell them, okay, now you're going to school because you submitted your FAFSA or you have your FAFSA, right? And I tease them and then they just don't use it, right? So e either parent can apply for Parent PLUS loan. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have to worry about doing that. What is CSS? CSS, it's just the CSS profile is the second financial aid form that about two to 300, mostly private, but there's a few public schools in there, require in addition to the FAFSA. So if they require it, you've got to submit both financial aid forms. And if you don't submit the CSS, like we were saying earlier, then the college isn't going to give out their endowment money. You'll get federal aid if applicable um, because you submitted the FAFSA, but not the endowment money. So you wanna make sure that you submit that if it's required. Um, so the change starts in 2023. So the, the FAFSA Simplification Act that Shelly and I have referenced it's effective on the October 1, 2023 FAFSA. So a year from now, the FAFSA will just about start. That's going to be the reduced number of questions. That's that's the FAFSA. That's going to be for the 24-25 school year. Because remember, like when you submit the FAFSA this fall, if you have a senior, it's for the 23-24 school year. So it's always the next school year. So I am sole legal guardian for my daughter. Does that mean I am the only responsible party to spend my daughter's college tuition? My daughter's attending college starting fall. If you're the if you're the sole legal guardian, you're not married, you would submit the FAFSA. That would be it. it the change that's happening if you're divorced is what happens if the definition of the person that submits 
is going to be the parent that provides more financial support instead of where the child has spent the most time. That's that's the difference. I think it's going to open up a giant can of worms. Because <laughs> they're going to say, well, I do this and I do this and I pay for soccer. So it'll be it'll be very interesting how how that works out. Um, do you recommend taking federal loans starting in freshman year and each year after if you're anticipating needing money to pay um, that you haven't saved? If you are going to take out loans, which for a lot of people, it's part of their college funding strategy, and that's okay. Responsible borrowing is okay. Out of control borrowing, that's not going to it's not going to serve anybody in your family. So yes, you should do a four-year cash flow, right? And, and talk to a professional if that's making your head spin. I do these all day. I love doing these. I'm a nerd, right? Um, in this way, but plan it out and not when you're about, when you've already made a decision, plan it out when you're deciding which schools ideally to apply to, right? You don't, you're not getting to the penny, but you're knowing, okay, this, this is going to be 20,000 in loans. And this one's going to be 120,000 and the 120,000 maybe should go off the list. Or maybe that's when grandma steps in, or you sit down with your child and say, you know what, you're going to have a side hustle finding private scholarships if you get in there. And if you can't find enough, then that's not going to work. And so your child knows when they're applying I understand the affordability of my different options on my list. And the beauty of doing that, and I did this with my two, is when you have to have that conversation, which I did with my son between Indiana and another school that I will not name, that was 70,000 more. And I said, well, you like both schools. We had the conversation. And he said, great, I'm going to IU. So I didn't have the issues because I laid that groundwork ahead of time. So, but yes, those are the best loans to take out. So you want to do your four year. And I always tell people, don't just use up all your five, two nines. And that gets to junior year. And you're like, oh, I want those federal direct loans from freshman and sophomore year. And you can't get them. And, it, and they're great loans because it's in your child's name. As I said, anybody can pay it off at any time. But your child starts building a credit history, which is good, too, because when they uh, when they they want to get out and move in an apartment with their buddies, you're, you're, you're signing the lease with them if they have no credit history. So, okay, we only have a couple minutes left, so we're not going to get to all these questions. Um, but let me look here. I want to see if, um, yeah, Jerry, there's a, there's a link. I'll, I'll, I'll get Shelly to answer another question and I'll, I'll, I'll post in the chat the link to uh, see the value um, it's a federal housing value calculator. So I will pop that in there for you. And then everybody else will have it too. Um, is, there, is there a list of schools that require CSS to be completed? You can Google CSS profile participating schools and you will get a list. It may or may not be updated. The best place for this information is the website, right? Shelly probably has resources that when she works with students that say what they require in my cap, it says institutional or federal. So it's not hard information to find. Um, that's how that works. So let me see. Okay, somebody's telling me that they make more than 80,000. Should I bother to fill out the FAFSA? I don't know your stake on this, Shelly, but we tell every family to submit the FAFSA. FAFSA, could be required to give out merit aid, which is the non-need-based aid that Bill Gates's kids can get. So don't leave money on the table by not submitting the FAFSA. That's one of, you can't get the direct federal student loans I've talked about. Um, there's just a whole bunch of reasons. It's free. It's probably the only thing that's free in this process. And you're sharing your personal information with the government. You're already filing taxes. It's different than CSS where you're sending all these tax returns to a college. So yes, yes, yes. Um, or will they not even give us merit if our EFC is high? I'll let Shelly speak to that. Has that happened? I'm sure it's happened in some schools, in some cases with some students. Um, you can't lose sleep over all of these little things in this process because you literally um, never sleep, right? You just can't get too stressed about all of it. I'll let you, because you deal on the admission side, 
how you counsel on that, we tell everybody to submit the FAFSA and then uh, we'll do one more question and then we'll probably wrap up here. So go for that one, Shelley. So we're right on board with you, Peg. If this is the way we look at it, there's no downside to doing the FAFSA. They already know all of your taxes. You already, it, all they do is connect it to your, your taxes. I did it all by myself for nine years and it's really not a difficult form to complete. So I would just say they know about you and it's an easy form to complete. I would say absolutely yes. The other thing that I would really encourage everybody to do is to look at before your student applies to a school, is it a school that will have ask for the CSS profile? Because that is the sketchy one. That is the one where they get all up in your business and it it's a lot of work. I'm not gonna lie, I had to do it four years at Harvard. But the FAFSA is so simple and it, it really is just a couple of clicks. It's not intrusive. The day that you complete the FAFSA is the one of the poorest days <laughs> that you're going to encounter all year. So you don't want to have waited till you get a huge bonus at work, have them hold off on that bonus before it goes into your bank account. Completely ethical, completely you know, logical, but I just have to say it because people are always like, oh, why didn't anybody tell me? So I'm, I'm doing that. I consult with my clients. It doesn't matter if you're a multi-millionaire or a need-based student, if it keeps your student from earning any merit scholarship, that is a shame. So I'm with you, Peg. I highly recommend that every family does it. And you know, it may be like doing the lottery, but sometimes you come out a huge winner. So it, it's, really, it's really the way to go if you want any type of opportunity. Yeah. Okay. We are in hundred percent agreement. Okay. I'm going to grab this last question for you. And then guys, you know, we'll be here in two weeks and I will share that we are having discussions within cap about having office hours more, more often so that we can handle more questions. You know, if we have tons and tons of people, we're never going to get to all of them, but if you're in the my cap um, software, you can always um, go into the community in there and post a question and support at collegeapro.com as well. And we'll tell you if your question is in depth and you need to book some time with an expert, we'll let you know. So here's the last question we'll handle here, Shelly. Hi there, Shelly. How do you approach answering the question on determining if tuition at a private institution, e.g. Duke, is, is quote, worth it versus a comparable state school? We will end on that very easy to answer question. <laughs> so, so this is such a great, this, I spend a lot of time on this when we're building our college list. It really is come, gonna come down to what is the end game? Does your student want to be a botanist? Do they wanna be in social work? Do they wanna be in law, CPA, engineering? Do they wanna live near that expensive college and use the alumni and the network? Do they want to live in another country? It's not as simple as comparing school X and school Y, because it really is going to come down to what is your student's major? Are they going to want to apply to med school, law school? And will that impact that next level? There are a lot of different strategies that you can use. And that's why picking the right college list is so critical. You want to have some of each opportunity, because remember your student applies in the fall of their senior year, but they don't really pick until the spring of their senior year. And you know how fast those teenagers can change their mind. So plan for everything and have the family discussion. If you get in and have no scholarships, this may be off your list, it's a harder conversation. Well, I got in and then you have to tell them, I'm sorry, we can't afford it. So it's really being proactive in the conversation and getting really clear. Does your student have an opportunity to get some really good money at that school? That's the conversation you want to start with. 
Okay. Well, I tried to um, I tried to answer a few questions while you were chatting here. So thanks for all your questions, guys. I know there's still a bunch more on here. We will keep you posted if we're going to increase our uh, office hours so that we could handle more and more questions. Um, but definitely get into the MyCap software, into the community. And Shelly, do you want to share... Um, just share your email address or anything. If people, if people are looking, you know, for support around admissions and everything, or should they just go to your website? We can see it behind you. So I am going to gift your listeners a copy of my best-selling book for free. All they have to do is go www.freebook.collegeReadyplan.com. This book is a foundation of everything we talked about this evening. I don't get into the weeds, but I, I make some foundation recommendations, some conversation starters. So that's the first thing, freebook.collegeReadyplan.com. And then for anybody who would like to go deeper into a specific student's needs, athletically, academically, you know, uh, I, I deal a lot with spectrum kids there. Every student has their own path. I am happy to gift a free discovery call with myself. If you just go to collegereadyplan.com, click on discovery call, say you heard it on peg show, um, my cap either one. And I will be more than happy to sit on a zoom call with you and your student and talk about their unique situation and how they will stand out in their world. So thank you so much. And I hope- Oh, wow. That is really, that's a surprise to me. Believe me, I didn't know <laughs> she was going to do that. So that is wonderful. And actually there was a question with somebody about, you know, having a child um, who has autism. So that's really lovely. So collegereadyplan.com, her discovery call. And then the URL, I was just going to pop it in the chat. It's free book dot college ready plan dot com. That's what you said, right? That is correct. Okay. Well, listeners, you should be all over that because that's an awesome, awesome offer. So, all right. Well, thank you so much um, for your time, Shelly. And thanks for staying eight minutes over too. Uh -huh. And, uh, and everybody else have a lovely evening and uh, we will see you on the next office hours. Thank you.